in. So a uh, very warm welcome uh, to everybody and thank you for attending uh, this uh, session uh, offered by uh, the SDR division, this virtual distinctiveness session uh, between the strategic uh, management and human resource uh, research uh, fields. I'm Philip Mayer-Doyle, I'm Associate Professor of Strategy at INSEAD and I'm part of the uh, executive committee of the SDR division and uh, organized this uh, event. Uh, and again, very warm welcome uh, to this event. So uh, the, the idea behind this event, uh, and I have to credit uh, Michael Leibland uh, with this, is really to help uh, scholars uh, that are kind of active in both of these fields to connect uh, with the foundations of both strategic management and the HR fields and understand the distinctive contribution of each field and also the potential intersection of these fields. And importantly, of course, uh, to understand research opportunities at the intersection, especially uh, as we're looking forward, uh, how these fields are developing and have been uh, developing. Uh, and uh, it's great that we have got uh, five fantastic panelists uh, for uh, this session. And I've just, you know, the, the computer screen uh, arranged them for me in random order. Uh, so, so you know, uh, the, the fact that some pictures are bigger than others does not necessarily uh, have any impact. Uh, so uh, first of all, of course, Jay Barney, uh, Presidential Professor of Strategic Management and the Lazon Chair of Social Entrepreneurship at the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah. Uh, Peter Capelli, the George W. Taylor Professor and Professor of Management at the Wharton School of the University uh, of Pennsylvania, uh, Dan Alfenbein, Professor of Organization and Strategy and Associate Dean as well at the Olin Business School uh, of the University, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, uh, Rebecca Cahoe, Associate Professor of Human Resources at the ILR School uh, at Cornell University, and Patrick Wright, the Thomas Van Diver Bicentennial Professor uh, and Chair uh, and the director of the Center for Executive Succession at the Dala Moore School of Business at the University uh, of South Carolina. So uh, Peter Capelli actually had a last minute request and had to travel uh, and is very at the very moment on a plane. So instead of presenting to you live, uh, he has uh, recorded a video, uh, which I will uh, play. And after that, uh, we're going to hand the baton to the other uh, for uh, panelists in alphabetical order. And at the end, we have about 20 minutes uh, for any questions uh, and any uh, open uh, discussion as well. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, let me start and um, share the video that Peter recorded. Well, folks, it's nice to be with you. I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this uh, program. I'm thinking, uh, really, my net contribution here is limited to the fact that I was around when a lot of this discussion about strategy and human resources generally got going. Uh, so I know something about that. And I've been away from this for quite a while. So I'm looking maybe at some of these issues with fresh eyes, which might be useful. Uh, I should say that I did talk uh, a little bit with uh, Clint Chadwick about some of these issues before, but you should not blame him for anything I'm about to, to say uh, about them. Um, so let me maybe begin uh, with history, which are some things that maybe a lot of people here don't know. Um, this issue about trying to get human resources and strategy kind of together has pretty long roots. They go back to workforce planning. By the 1950s, most US corporations had large departments that did workforce planning. And there was pretty sophisticated software in the 1960s that would calculate for companies things like flight risks by department, would tell you what kind of turnover you could expect to have for the next couple of years and how much hiring you'd have to do in order to meet your training needs and skill needs, all that sort of stuff. So they were pretty into it. My friend Jim Walker, who was uh, a professor at Iowa, uh, and then after that ran the consulting practice for Towers Perrin, uh, started a group called the Human Resource Planning Society, where many of the sharper tools and 
the practitioner world. We're hanging out trying to get better at some of these issues. Uh, the big push in this area came with Michael Porter's generic strategies. You may recall those. The idea that there was just a set of reasonably small number, five strategies that everybody kind of was going to pursue. You just had to choose among them. And people in management were quite exercised around this idea. There was no field of strategy before this. It was just called uh, things like business. Um, oh, what was the name of it for strategy departments? Now I can't remember. Uh, business policy is what departments that became strategy were called. Um, what Chuck Snow and Ray Miles did in one of the best of these, the most famous of these studies, was just to say, all right, if this is your generic strategy, this is how you ought to manage human capital in order to make that happen. And in some ways, this was the high water mark for the intersection of human resources and strategy. It was particularly useful for human resources at that time because that's when a lot of the practices of human resources that have been created in large corporations, mainly by IO psychologists, were kind of being discarded. So the question was, well, you know, where, what are we supposed to be doing? And so this provided a nice kind of way out for that uh, answer to that question. Got some additional momentum with people mainly in economics and industrial relations side of the fence, um, talking about the economic or business outcomes associated with human resource practices. So high performance work systems, empowerment in particular, lots of studies of that stuff, gave it some momentum and you're going to hear a lot about that probably over the course of today. Um, but there were problems. And the first of these problems was that Dick Rommelt and company uh, kind of demolished the idea of generic strategies. There really didn't seem to be evidence that those things worked. Um, but there was something more fundamental that began to play out over the next decade or two and has not stopped. And that is the idea that in most corporations, even ones that have reasonably clear and small product market focuses, narrow focuses. The idea of a strategy as a way, a unified approach to competing in markets really doesn't seem very important anymore. Most corporations operate more like investment banks. They're thinking about uh, business, about corporate strategy rather than business strategy, M&As, financial transactions, getting in and out of markets quickly acquiring competencies rather than trying to build them. So it's just hard to tell the kind of alignment stories that were popular a couple of decades ago. And, you know, to think about this, imagine, realize how many times we have to pull up Southwest Airlines when we're teaching to talk about an example of alignment, you know, of a company that has a business strategy that derives completely from the way it manages its people. It's just not many examples of that. So into this context, we start to see a different, um, maybe almost a competitive approach from the field of strategy. First, thinking about patents and how when you move patents around, uh, companies acquire different kinds of competencies and you move the people with those patents. That's really what's going on. If you looked at the big literature in law firms, it's sort of the same story. Law firms were unique because all the capital is human capital and moving those people around, you know, you got the same sorts of issues. But those are pretty idiosyncratic cases. Um, and what we saw, started to see instead in, in this group, this program today, we're going to hear about too, is this idea of strategic human capital, which is kind of applying human capital theory to broader business context to think about how this might be a way to explain how companies could generate some rents. Okay. So now we've got these sort of two streams of research, uh, the older strategic human capital approach and this newer strategic, or the old, sorry, I should say the older strategic human resource approach and the newer strategic human capital approach. So are these folks gonna come together? Well, uh, you may remember in high school, Algebra, the following story, if strategic human capital leaves a private university at 10 a.m. going 50 miles an hour and 
strategic human resources leaves the state university at 12 noon going 40 miles an hour uh, how long will it take them to meet well the answer here is they're not going to meet because they're not headed in the same direction strategic human capital is really a tool um, looking for places it could be applied and strategic human resources at least the way it looks to me is still a kind of a goal and the goal is to think about how we might explain competitive advantage using evidence or facts or principles or practices from managing people. So the way this looks to me going forward is that uh, the place with the challenge or the problem is strategic human resources, which is not a new problem. It's in some ways kind of got the innovator's dilemma problem of being caught in the legacy of alignment and the power that idea had. Um, and you can start to see it with this idea of macro foundations as well, micro foundations. And this is the idea of, can't we try to pull strategy in by identifying some of the individual level phenomena, which is associated with mainly with psychology, right, as a way to ground this. Well, this approach in philosophy of sciences is called methodological individualism. It's been tried in lots and lots of different fields. Pretty fair to say it's never worked. And the reason is because it's literally not true. And that is you can always find concepts or make statements about organizations and groups that are not true of the individuals in them. So for example, you could say, you know, Americans are getting taller and it's not the case that every individual American is getting taller, right? So there are statements about organizations that are true that are not true at the micro level, right? So uh, here's where we stand, a really hard problem um, about thinking about how to create rents or how you create competitive advantage that the strategic human resource people in particular are, are focused on. Um, strategic human capital people are looking at a particular way in which rents are created. Uh, the problem here is that we can see some clear examples where it's true, where you could see alignment, you could see why it drives competitive advantage, but you can see lots and lots of cases where that's not what's going on at all. And if you'll forgive me for the analogy, our colleagues who study cancer uh, have realized that this is not a single disease, uh, even though it's got this common manifestation, like business being successful. Uh, the causes of it uh, are so different. In cancer, it's now just seen as a series of diseases with very disparate causes. So a, a research approach that, whose goal is to try to identify how competencies create, or managing people create competencies which create rents is pretty limited because there's just not that many examples of it anymore where it explains the bigger problem of how companies create rents. So where does this leave us in terms of a path going forward? Well, here's the biggest thing to note. We've got competitors uh, and the competitors are in the field of strategy. If I look at strategy departments, not just my own, but Columbia and more recently Stanford and other places, it's full of people who are studying worker, employment, human capital issues, not from a strategic human capital perspective. They're just looking at how these practices might explain something about business outcomes. And to some extent, they're just trying to explain how these practices affect outcomes per se, like hiring. Um, and this group is pretty big. Uh, it's even bigger in organization theory. Um, this is a big group out there that is basically eating the lunch of everybody else. They're producing the interesting results. They're producing stories about companies and organizations um, which are meaningful and, in, and important. You know, if you look at the history of business schools, you look at the history of social sciences, the groups that gain power are the ones that are talking about empirical problems that matter. And in the world of workplace and human resources generally, there's so many interesting stories right now. There's so many new practices from gigs to automation to AI um, that demand some attention. And 
the way to make progress is to head in that direction, I think. The winners in these areas have always been the people and the groups that address and answer important empirical questions. And I think that's the way to bet going forward. Okay, so we, we've heard from Peter. And if you've got any comments, um, please keep them uh, for after all the panelists have shared uh, their view. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we're going to proceed in alphabetical order after Peter's video. So I would like to hand the baton to uh, Jay Barney uh, for his views uh, on that matter. Can you hear me okay? Great. So uh, uh, like Peter, um, I've, I've been around this set of questions for a while. Um, um, it's interesting. Uh, there's some important differences between the world as I see it, the world that, that Peter just described that hopefully we can uh, talk about as we go forward. Um, as a, a strategy scholar, and that's what I am, um, I'm interested in, in understanding um, why some firms outperform others. Um, uh, and as probably some of you know, uh, over the years, I have my work has tended to focus on um, idiosyncratic cost to copy resources and capabilities as an explanation of why some firms can outperform others, especially over longer periods of time. Um, um, the theory that I am associated with, resource based theory, doesn't um, specify. Uh, what those resources and capabilities will be. Uh, in fact, it can't. If it did, then it would be rules for riches, and that would be a, a logical conundrum we couldn't really get our way out of. So um, so it doesn't say, uh, here are the uh, six things, or is it seven? I don't remember. Here are the six or seven things you must do in order to be successful. These things are, as soon as you see that kind of title, you should just decide not to waste your time on that book. Um, but what the theory does say is, here are the kinds of resources and capabilities, that is the attributes of resources and capabilities that seem more likely than not to be a source of competitive advantage. Um, and, uh, and so over the years, the theory has been applied to study a whole bunch of different resources and capabilities. Uh, that said, from the very beginning, really uh, in 1986, um, it struck me that human capital ha had many of the attributes or potentially in some settings had many of the attributes that the theory said should be important in understanding why some firms outperform others. Um, this was different than the alignment thing that uh, approach that uh, Peter Capelli had. So the alignment approach was we're gonna choose a strategy and then we're gonna organize um, our human resources activities to be consistent with the strategy that we've chosen. Um, and uh, that's certainly a, a point of view. Um, the, this, the, the point of view from resource-based theory was, uh, was, was not so much choosing, separating uh, strategy and, and, and human capital and, and trying to align the two. Uh, the approach we took was, we're just trying to understand where rents come from. And Peter was right about that. That's really what we're interested in. Why is it that some uh, you're able to in some firms are able to acquire resources and capability access to resources and capabilities in a way that generates uh, economic value. Uh, and human capital seemed to have at least two characteristics that um, maybe three characteristics that were interesting on on from that point of view. Uh, on the one hand, uh, there's reason to believe uh, that uh, many labor markets. Uh, which is an example of the strategic factor market. Many labor markets are not efficient. That is, they're not uh, highly competitive. For a variety of reasons, there's a variety of um, entry and exit barriers, but mostly it's because uh, we think now that um, uh, people who are operating in labor markets often have an interest besides simply maximizing their wealth and making decisions. Anyone who has children in high school know that, you know, you got to kind of hang around a place or your kids will hate you. So uh, uh, that's not a sort of traditional, it's utility maximizing, not traditional wealth maximizing. 
So there might be some uh, inefficiencies in the uh, in labor markets that could create the possibility for um, uh, profit generation. And the second thing, uh, another thing that's interesting about um, human capital is uh, the possibility of co-specialization. Co-specialization um, then creates another kind of inefficiency in labor markets where um, uh, if if we are able to create more value together than we could separately because of both specialized human capital, then um, uh, in the labor market, our human capital might be priced individually, but in the firm, if it brought together, it could be generated value at a collective level that was greater than the sum of the individual um, value creation, which would be you know a classic uh, a source of, of profit generation. So that those are the, the possibility. Uh, those possibilities uh, um, seem to to point to human capital as a potential source of human capital of, of, of economic profits. Of course, the challenge with human capital was unlike so many other resources and capabilities a firm might uh, have, uh, you can't own human capital. Um, it's both illegal and immoral, uh, and so um, and so. Uh, uh, to the extent that human capital is a source of competitive advantage for a firm economic profit, um, it, it it goes home every night, and that's uh, and that's an unusual challenge uh, for for the theory. So the question becomes: How do you connect? Uh, how do you uh, find ways to induce your employees to make firm specific human capital investments? Because man, they don't they they're not required to do so. Uh, they have agency and those things. Uh, how do you induce them to make those specific investments? But in a way that still allows you to appropriate to the firm and its shareholders appropriate some economic value. Uh, this ultimately leads, by the way, uh, interestingly in my own work, to a, a a much broader stakeholder perspective on strategy. Uh, strategy is about creating economic value, but um, but where do you, you have to you have to attract resources from a variety of stakeholders, including employees, and you have to induce those people to make specific investments. And one way to do that, of course, is to um, uh, enable them, at least some of those employees to share in the value they help create, which means that you have to treat some stakeholders besides shareholders as residual claimants. And, and as soon as you admit that possibility, then we're, we're in a stakeholder claim. So, um, so that is different than the alignment story that uh, that was being uh, that Peter discussed, um, but it is consistent with uh, with uh, at least the resource based theory of um, um, competitive advantage in, in the field strategy. So um, uh, Pat Wright and I uh, actually sort of began to explore this. I don't remember what year that was. Pat, do you remember when we wrote that paper together? Ninety seven. <clears throat> So some of you were probably not born in 97, but we were. And, and we began to uh, write uh, some papers that, that spoke to this question. Although I don't think we had the full logic worked out about why human capital could be a source of potential, a source of competitive advantage for firms. But, uh, but I, I also acknowledge instantly that, that this was very different than the alignment story. The alignment story is choose a strategy and organize human capital. If anything, resource-based theory is, well, human capital do you have, and therefore what strategies should you pursue sort of reverse alignment as opposed to the alignment that, that Peter was talking about. So over the years, um, there's been a variety of, of uh, uh, research traditions to try to address this, this issue empirically as well as theoretically. I think we've made some progress. I think empirically it's been challenging. Um, the data is required to really address these issues is quite complicated to get. The good news is that there are now at least one or two data sets, uh, I guess mostly from Northern Europe, um, that um, have a kind of individual micro level uh, of individuals matched to organizations over time, all the things you need to begin to really track uh, human capital. And I, I know I'm working with a co-author on a paper that begins to look at some of these issues in a more in, you know, empirically, in a little more precise kind of way. Um, it's interesting, um, uh, as all this has been happening in, in relationship between uh, strategy and human capital and HR, uh, HR itself, and I'd love to hear my HR colleagues talk about this, but HR itself seems to have um, 
been subject to some schizophrenia, some conflict between sort of the micro HR people who are still very much focusing on the IO psychology of things uh, and the more macro strategic oriented uh, the stuff that we've been talking about here. I'd like to hear how that's evolving and what challenges that creates. But uh, So I guess with respect to what Peter had to say, I think the alignment story still has value and we should be looking at that. But that's not really the, the story that we were telling in the strategy literature. Um, we were just looking for what are the sources of rents and one of those sources might be in some circumstances human capital. Um, by the way, his his comment that corporations these days um, are more like investment banking firms and don't really um, build human capital. I, I think he spends what, too much time working with very large companies. In the entrepreneurial world that I work in, it's all about human capital. That's all it is, is human capital and a little bit of technology on the side. So uh, it depends on your your experience. And, and, and But I'll stop there and I'll let some take over. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Jay. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that we're already getting some disagreements uh, on some points there. <laughs> okay, uh, next, let me hand over to uh, Dan Elfenbein. Uh, and Dan has obviously published a recently a very interesting paper uh, with Adina Sterling on uh, is hiring strategic uh, in strategy science. And so from that perspective, uh, you know, it was very, very interesting to hear his views on, on, on the point. So Dan, thank, thank, thanks, Philip, and thanks to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I, the, I think what I'll talk about will follow well from both uh, Peter and, and Jay. They're the Jedi masters in this, and I am simply the, the apprentice. Uh, uh, but let me just tell you what, what I, um, and thanks, Philip, for the, the plug for the paper with Adina. I'll definitely talk about that. But let me just tell you what, what I bring or the baggage I bring with me to this question uh, that I've been asked to talk about. I'm an economist by training. Uh, with that said, I'm married to a social psychologist, so I'm grudgingly aware that people are, are, are motivated by things beyond money, that they have emotions, that it makes things interesting. My, my strategy orientation has become less around searching for competitive advantage and more uh, around thinking about what drives persistent performance differences among seemingly similar enterprises. At the same time, you know, I started working with Mike Porter even before graduate school and Jan Rifkin at Monitor. So I've been imprinted very strongly with this alignment fit and position orientation towards thinking about what drives those performance differences. And, and over time, I've come to, to appreciate uh, the resource base view more and more. And I think it has a lot to say for, for this question. Uh, finally, I'll say that um, I, I'm ignorant when it comes to the HR literature, uh, but I have read Moneyball. Uh, and so that's where uh, a lot of my insight into this uh, comes from. But it's, of course, it's going to come with a tremendous amount of uh, limitation. And my, my contribution attempt here is just to raise a few questions um, that uh, might be useful for for the for the division. Uh, I, I think of them as one sort of uh, existential question, and then four maybe substantive questions. The existential question is, what are we even talking about in terms of performance? What performance measure do we care about? Um, and then the the substantive questions are around uh, what sort of model of the individual we should we use? I think Jay has already foreshadowed some of this. What model of the organization should we use? And I think this is, may may bridge some of the 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 differences between Peter and Jay's views. Um, when I think of alignment and fit, which matters in some circumstances, but not in others, I, I think we do need to understand that more deeply. And then, then the last question, which I hope to be provocative and hip and answer, and at, at asking at least, and this kind of connects with my work with Adina is, all right, in, in the end is, is human resources gonna end up being managed better by uh, an AI or, or by people? Is it strategic in some sense in a way that senior managers need to care about? Um, um, and, and so to the to this first existential question, what performance measure are we using? You know, an economist might think of a firm's output as 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 y, the the labor hour input may be adjusted for quality as as l, and, and then the the price of that that unit of labor as being w. And at, at the very kind of highest level, we can focus either on productivity, which is the ratio of output to input, or profitability. These are rents that J J and uh, and uh, Peter were talking about. And these things are, are they're highly correlated, but they're not exactly the same. And, and as Peter, uh, as, as Jay talked about, if, if you start to talk about this profitability stuff, you've got some of these things, Y and L, which are really under the control of the firm or the organization. And then this 
this W like depends on what's going on in the labor market, these outside options. And it's, it, it becomes kind of a, a different story if you start to look at sort of what's driving productivity versus what's driving, driving rents. And, and we don't always acknowledge that difference. And I, I wish we would do it a little bit more. There may also be a bit of a trade-off between these two, some senses in which they're in opposition. And, and the only paper that I'm going to cite in, in, this, in, this, in this talk is this great econometric paper uh, by Abode, Kramartz, and Margolis, which shows that on the one hand, high wage firms are less profitable, but on the other hand, they're more likely to survive shock. So this sort of trade-off between you know, how you pay, uh, in Jay's words, so this how you share the, 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 the rents with stakeholders and how well the firm can react to new things or drive growth, or you know, this is something I, I you know, I haven't seen enough of perhaps in the, in the literature. And anyway, so so it's a, a food for food for thought here. Um, you know, Jay already mentioned this. We we've got um, a lot of different choices in the menu when it comes to what motivates people. Whether it's you know economists and the sociologists, whether it's money and status, the entrepreneurship people would say, oh, it's also freedom and independence. And then you know Todd Zenger, Dean Gartenberg, and others say, well, they also are looking for purpose and meaning. You know, I. I you know, I, I don't know what the right answer is. I, I have a, a sense that it depends on context when it comes to behavior. Sometimes we're thinking of people as being purely opportunistic. Sometimes we're thinking of them as other regarding. When it comes to cognition and rationality, sometimes we're thinking about people as, you know, using all the information that they've got. Other times we think about people as just using a subset of the information they've got. They're biased in some way. And, and then this last box, this bottom right box for me is uh, what are assumptions are we making about productivity and ability? Uh, in the um, in the workforce, is it normally distributed, or is it somehow distributed some like like a power law? And is the real job of HR managers and HR to find those ten x engineers around whom we build a whole organization? My my only kind of argument here is, is that different settings need different combinations of these assumptions, and so investment bankers, inventors, doctors, and daycare workers are going to look different according to these dimensions, and. And as we do our empirical studies and as we do our theorizing, I think it's important to just be explicit about what, what assumptions we're making, what background, implicit, you know, what we believe about what's going on that help us both interpret the data and also think about where, where it, it's generalizable to. And so, so that's the right model of the individual. What's the right model of the organization? Um, and here, I'm just going to truly, truly oversimplify what, what's going on here. But, but in, in one world, you think of organizations as, as being additive in terms of the productivity or ability of the different uh, employees. And so, you know, as, as, as Jay early on kind of pointed out, if, if, if um, labor markets are perfect, then in this kind of world, everybody gets paid their marginal product. There's no profitability or rent from human capital. Of course, he doesn't believe that, but, but that's kind of the the world in which this this would happen. This is think of this as a golf team. There's another world in which the organization is the product of the ability of the workers. Right here, if you put Lionel Messi and Dan Elfenbein on a soccer team, there aren't going to be a lot of goals full scored. But if you put Lionel Messi and Kylian Mbappe on a soccer team, you're going to score a heck of a lot of goals. And so the there's constant interaction um, uh, and. Uh, you know, the value of, of a human resource acquisition depends on what else you've got around him in terms of other HR, right, um, or other, other resource assets. And so that, that is more complicated, obviously, than the additive world. It's different. Um, and then there's this, this, this third world, which has sort of elements of, of additive, where we do some work on our own, but we also have some interactions. And maybe the interactions are, are multiplicative, but maybe the interactions are, are even more subtly uh, connected. And I, I call this 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 a baseball world where sometimes people are up to bat where it's an individual activity and sometimes they're in the field where not only are, are their abilities interacting with one another but with the strategy of the organization matters and so um the the point I'd, I'd love to just make and I think this this maybe helps bridge a little bit Peter's world and 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 uh Jay's world is it's important to, have, to match the model to the context sometimes you're in a multiplicative world sometimes you're in an additive world sometimes you're in this fit or alignment world. Um, and and they're, they're, they all exist, um, um, I think. Um, so the third question is, how should we think about fit? And I suspect that HR folks and others have, have thought much more deeply about this than I have. Um, but in my work, two types of, of fit within an organization have, have come to the fore. One is just simple skill complementarity and um, 
Uh, this was highlighted in, in a paper that uh, I worked on with Adina. And another is cognitive complementarity, which comes out of work that I've been doing with John Chen Hardposen and, and Mingju Wang that's um, uh, about bias. Um, and so um, why are complementarities important? Well, they create opportunities for strategic decisions back to what Jay was talking about. Do you put the strategy first and then hire people or do you hire people and then pull the strategy? You know, once you have these complementarities, you got to start thinking about that and it creates some room for strategic decision-making, which I, I think is interesting in our, our normative, the normative part of our, uh, of our work. All right. And so the, the, the skill complementarity example that we build on in, in uh, the strategy science paper is around baseball. And in baseball, you have some pitchers who are very skilled at getting strikeouts. You have other pitchers that are still very good at their jobs, but don't strike a lot of people out. They throw the ball in a way that it's hit into the field and generates outs. And so Shohei Otani and Cal Quantrill won the same number of games, pitched around the same number of innings, but Cal Quantrill struck out uh, nearly 100 fewer people than Shohei Otani, generated 40% more fielding opportunities for his, his infielders and outfielders than, than Otani. And so while in both, you know, in both teams, I want to hire the best shortstop that I can, uh, in Cal Quantrill's team, the fielding ability of my shortstop is going to matter more than the fielding ability of my shortstop in the Shohei Otani's team. And so that's, you know, not, not a super profound insight, um, but it does kind of, I, I think, crystallize this idea that, that in HR, at least the hiring part of HR, the value of a new hire is going to depend on the skills of existing employees, which creates some path dependency and creates some room for or uh, thinking, I would call strategically, this is also sort of changing over time. In the um, AMR piece, um, we develop a computational simulation that talks about two agents that combine to exploit a new business opportunity. And these agents learn things about this new business opportunity independently, um, and then they come together perhaps to make a decision. They can have some bias, and that's what's, I think, the most interesting part of the paper. They, they may be biased in terms of how optimistic or pessimistic they are initially, and they may also be biased in terms of their learning speed. Some jump to conclusions quickly, others uh, need a lot of evidence to change their mind. And the, the what what we sort of do in the paper, but uh, I'm, I'm flexing it a bit for this discussion, is, is ask the following question. If you have on, on your team already an optimist, when is it helpful to add another person to that team? And the answer is it depends on uh, the bias of that next person. Another question you could ask is if your first team member is an optimist and what type of person is it best to pair him or her with? Uh, an optimistic agent, a pessimistic agent, or unbiased agent? And the answer is it depends on the decision-making structure that you, you put in place. Uh, an or structure works best when you've got an optimist and a pessimist, and and structure actually works really well when you've got two optimists. So they both need to say yes to, to come. I mean, this and and there's some other stuff here too. Um, when it comes to the work that 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 we do outside this, I guess a question I'll have for for everyone is: Do we want to think of these cognitive biases as canceling out in hiring in big organizations, or is this actually something to lean into? Uh, we want to hire a bunch of optimists and put them together with a structure that that takes advantage of that kind of bias. And if so, how does that uh, how does that um, filter into uh, the work that that we do uh, both theoretically and um, and empirically? And then the last question. Um, um, on the one hand, I said I, would, I was going to try to be cute here and say something about AI, but the reality is that Adina and I have been looking at this for, for or at least thinking about this for, for a while. And I'm going to have to oversimplify this dramatically, but um, you know, we, we were asked actually by Michael years ago to, to write for the special issue of Strategy Science on, on what, are, what is strategic about HR. And the way we attacked this was to, to have two conjectures. One is like, all right, if you could really kind of tie up HR decisions and, and delegate them effectively without affecting a firm's performance, then in principle, you could have a machine do them. And if you could do that, then, then maybe these aren't so strategic in the sense that they require senior management attention or sort of, you know, uh, the, the understanding and exploitation of trade-offs. And kind of we went through and then kind of tried to think about along a number of different dimensions what would the different implications of those um, uh, different factors be? Um, and I, I can't say that we, we came to an answer. Uh, the answer is gonna be, it depends. 
but certainly the existence of complementarities and the idea of driving alignment along with the path dependency and recognition of complementarities you know uh, brought us back to this idea that in many cases hr is truly going to be something that senior managers need to care about need to set the direction on and are going to be hard at least in the near term to train an ai to do effectively and so i'll just kind of pull this back to to um, extend the baseball analogy a little bit more which is to say that in in baseball around pitching there are two philosophies and these philosophies are taught from very early on one philosophy is to pitch for a swing and a miss which generates a strikeout and the other is to pitch to contact and if your organization has a pitch for swing and miss uh philosophy it affects your scouting, it affects your player acquisition, it affects the training you do, the how you have people lift weights, it affects your game strategy. And the, the uh, if you choose pitch to contact, all of that stuff is different. And this is just to point out that um, you know, there's this connection between your philosophy and your players. Um, and back to Jay's question, which comes first? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I think of it as one of the interesting questions that remain. And so my takeaways for those in the, in the audience are, one, can we be a little bit more explicit and thoughtful about our performance measures? I think it's really okay not to so focus solely on profitability. Can we also be more explicit about our assumptions about individuals? Um, I don't expect them to be fully general uh, and true for all contexts. They're gonna be true in some contexts and not others. It's okay for them to differ across contexts. Can we effectively match our contacts to, to a, a production model that we're clear about? Um, I think the results that we get are going to generalize within those models and not across them. I also think that's okay. And then, then finally, you know, can we go deeper into thinking about fit? Um, uh, th that's the, the exciting piece for me. Um, and uh, I look forward to um, seeing how uh, folks both react to this and, and maybe use it uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you, Dan. Uh, very, very interesting points. Um, let me hand over now to Rebecca. Thanks, Philip. Uh, so thanks for including me in the session. I'm excited to share some thoughts and to have a discussion afterward, hopefully if there's time left. Um, I think I took a little bit of a different approach, maybe a little bit more of an incremental and modest approach in preparing for the session, but I, I, I think there's some value in some of the thoughts that I want to share. Uh, so I, I took as a similar starting point this interest in uh, understanding how and when human capital serves as a source of competitive advantage like the others. Uh, where I differed was I, I don't have any new worlds to introduce. I don't have a big shift in inquiry to suggest. Instead, what I, what I really tried to do as I prepared for this session was to think about um, how can we take insights from these two domains, from the HR side and from the strategy side, to improve the questions we're already asking, to get a more complete understanding of the research that we're, we're already doing, the things we're already trying to solve. So starting with the HR side, and this isn't meant to be comprehensive, but I pull a few insights that I think are useful to this discussion. I think on the HR side, we have a, um, a significant emphasis, and I'll actually borrow Dan's words. We, we recognize that people have mo motives and emotions. Uh, we recognize that People, um, people make decisions about how they're going to contribute in organizations. People's contributions are influenced by the work environment, by the employment relationship, by their experiences in organizations in the day-to-day, -day, their relationships with peers and leaders, um, and by their attitudes and beliefs related to the organization. From that standpoint, we know that it's not enough to just bring in people with the right human capital to create value in the way that we hope. We need to manage, we need to think about how organizations manage the employment relationship to bring out the best of those contributions. On the strategy side, I think there is a greater emphasis on understanding the um, differences in characteristics of human capital. So we've already heard, we think about firm specificity, we can think about complexity, tacitness of knowledge. We, we know that the different characteristics of human capital influence value creation and also patterns of value capture. I think this work also does a tends to do a better job of uh, thinking about the broader competitive landscape, the broader labor market, really the more general external environment in which organizations and individuals are operating. 
So just a couple of baseline principles that everyone's familiar with, but that I think are useful uh, in thinking about moving forward research at these intersections and that I think there's still room to um, find more opportunities for cross-fertilization in our research in this space. So what I've done in my preparation today is really just to um, try this out to identify just a couple of basic opportunities for greater cross-fertilization in core areas where I see research being done, where I've done some research myself on this human capital and competitive advantage relationship. So I pose the question for myself, how can we apply perspectives from both the HR and strategy traditions to strengthen how we're defining and addressing research questions related to sourcing human capital, managing human capital, and related to human capital loss? So I'm not posing any new questions here. It, again, the goal really is to think about, can we borrow insights from each of those domains to strengthen our approach to identifying more complete answers to the questions that we're already asking? So um, in the area of sourcing human capital, there's a great deal of research in the strategy domain um, suggesting that organizations can benefit from hiring from particular source organizations, for instance, competitors, suppliers, clients. We know there are opportunities for learning by hiring where new hires are offering channels to bring knowledge uh, from, from their source firms. We know there are opportunities for interorganizational relational capital based on those new hires relationships with people from their original organization. We also know that these benefits don't automatically materialize. They require a certain set of activities. They require uh, the development of a certain type of relationships between new hires and incumbent employees in the new firm. We know they require the maintenance or further development of relationships between new hires and actors in their source organizations. So applying an HR perspective, a really, a really simple way to move forward on an, a question like this is how do we think about uh, managing the broader socialization context. When we bring new hires in from particular source organizations when we've got these specific objectives, tailored to these specific objectives. So if we have uh, if we have a goal of developing particular capabilities or achieving particular gains, how do we manage the work environment in order to uh, support new hires and the people around them in achieving these ends? There's a rich tradition in the HR literature looking at recruiting and selecting for the best new hires. I have best in quotes here because um, as, as Dan mentions in his paper, the paper that he shared, we tend to look at best new hires. We, we define this based on kind of effective performance in a particular job based on the best athlete model. There are opportunities to think about how we can better recruit and select based on the specific needs of organizations, but based on the specific facets of individuals' human capital. So I think there's opportunities to apply insights from HR research on recruitment and selection to better understand if these are the types of um, individuals we need, if this is the human capital we need, how are we actually going to get this human capital into the organization? Moving on to managing human capital. There's a rich tradition in the strategic HR literature looking at aligning HR strategy and business strategy, as we know, to improve firm performance. As others have already mentioned, there's opportunities to think about a broader array of stakeholders and outcomes when we think about what are the goals of alignment? What are the goals of the way we're thinking about designing the HR system in order to achieve what? What's the target? It doesn't just have to be uh, shareholder returns. I've done some research, many others have done research on benefits and challenges associated with STARS and organizations. We know STARS can bring vast benefits to organizations in terms of positive visibility. They can offer learning opportunities, status uh, increases associated uh, by, for the peers that they're working with. We also know that STARS can um, squash opportunities for their peers to learn, squash opportunities for creativity. They can create patterns of over-dependence with their employing organizations. There's been some conceptual work, including uh, by Jay and some others, on what are the implications for this, for how we can best manage STARS and their peers and the work environment around them. But there's really a need for um, empirical work and even further conceptual development that goes beyond just the, the financial incentive piece, but goes into the, the broader, managing the broader employment relationship, drawing on insights from the HR tradition uh, in a more general sense. Finally, I've, I've observed that um, strategy research on human capital loss often tends to focus on or emphasize employee turnover as a key source of loss of human capital. 
So there's, there's research on considering uh, how do we mitigate loss through things like non-competes or how do we reduce dependence on particular individuals so that uh, things don't fall apart when they leave an organization. I think there's room, I, I think this is important. I think there's also room to consider uh, measuring and mitigating loss associated with value creation among employees who are still in the organization due to burnout, withdrawal. So when, organi when organizations continue to employ employees with um, desire human capital, with value human ca valuable human capital, but those employees are no longer creating the same level of value because of a variety of reasons that we're not accounting for and leading to loss that we're not accounting for. We know there are some possible benefits or silver linings associated with employee mobility in terms of uh, opportunities for relational capital with organizations these employees ultimately go to. Uh, there's recent work on boomerang hires, so employees who leave organizations may be sources of hire in the future. What we know less is what are the implications for how we can best manage employees and alumni relationships in order to facilitate those opportunities, in order to facilitate those kind of post-exit value creation opportunities. Thinking on that needs to start before the employees actually leave the organization. So I'll wrap up with just a couple of final thoughts. Um, many scholars are already making great strides in these areas, so few if any of these ideas are unique to me or, or new um, today. I'm sharing op opportunities here for what I think is uh, a good approach to thinking about how do we just take a different perspective, in this case, the HR perspective and the strategy perspective, and allow it to um, help us grow the way that we're thinking about addressing the research questions that we're already asking. There have been some really good big ideas shared today. I think the reality for many of us is that we're going to be um, making strides in these areas by making smaller changes in our perspective to move the field forward. I think the, the field absolutely needs new big ideas and shifts in perspective that change the way we think about things. But I think these smaller changes um, can have a more immediate impact for the research we're already doing and are also important just as we kind of incrementally move the, move the field forward. So... I um, I thought about ending with a quote that said something about how, you know, we're all something along the lines of we're all interested in the same thing. We should grow from our differences. I ended up with this quote on baked goods that may be a little relevant, but probably less so. <laughs> it made me laugh. So I, I thought it might be a good place to end. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. Um, our last panelist, uh, Patrick, uh, if you could please uh, share with us your thoughts on this matter. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Rebecca. And uh, let me let me talk a little bit. I'll I'll note that I'm uh, you know going back to Dan's discussion about baseball. I guess this puts me at the bottom of the order. Um, and we know what that means. So um, in any case, just to give you a little bit about my background, because I kind of come from all over the place. I started as a psychology based person looking at traditional stuff of selection, performance, appraisal, et cetera, um, got into strategic HR and kind of the HR and per firm performance. So moving to the org level. Um, and now I'm back uh, doing CEO succession stuff and actually back to my psychology roots. And you'll see that come out in the discussion today. So just to give you a little bit, um, you know, Dan said that he's not an HR expert, but has read the book Moneyball, which actually is a great HR book. Um, people don't realize that, but it is an HR book. Um, but just to give you a little background about kind of what I would say the, the rough history of HR, um, it started with just traditional HR focused on um, HR practices to bring people in, manage them. So selection assessment, performance management, compensation, et cetera. Um, in kind of the 90s, uh, Peter talked about Jim Walker. Uh, Jim Walker was the first one to actually talk about a tying strategy to HR. Um, and what you saw then was this kind of a, a, a plethora of people saying, you know, reaching out to strategy and saying, here's how you tie this HR practice to strategy. So, you know, there was the Fombra and Tishy and Devana book, which was you know, how does selection support strategy? How does training support strategy and so on? Um, then we got into kind of the HR and performance uh, stuff where, you know, there were zillions of studies coming out, um, looking at the relationship between specific HR practices and performance. 
And then we get into the human capital where, um, again, as we've heard a lot today, human capital being a source of competitive advantage. And then, so what is uh, what, what kind of HR practices can lead to the type of human capital that can actually create a competitive advantage for organizations? Okay, so one of the questions that, that uh, uh, Philip posed to the group was, you know, kind of the theoretical areas. And I'd say, you know, in terms of theory, this is a one-way transfer. This is HR is little brother, uh, strategy is big brother. And HR is constantly trying to look up to big brother and see what big brother is doing and imitate that in some way. Um, so, you know, resource-based view came out and then all of a sudden HR was jumping on that. Human capital um, was in the strategy literature and then all of a sudden HR began doing that. And then economics, um, you know, again, it was uh, significantly within the strategy literature and then HR started trying to do that. Um, in fact, we had a conference here about 10 years ago, I think Jay was part of it, um, where, you know, we actually had to create almost a uh, economics to HR dictionary um, so that the HR people could understand all of the language that uh, those were coming from and, and, and as they were speaking econ. Um, but if I was to say, you know, where are kind of areas where where HR um, can contribute, um, particularly where I think strategy is kind of ignored HR and yet HR has something important to say to strategy, um, I'd say three areas. One is human capital. I'm not going to talk about that because we've talked a lot about that. Um, the other one is what I'll call CEO management. Um, and then last is dynamic capabilities. And so uh, let's talk about CEO management. Why do I say that? And that is because everybody focuses on the succession, right? And so we we have the Center for Executive Succession here. We've done a lot of work on CEO succession. Um, but but actually, one of the things that's, uh, I guess, been enlightening to me is that, you know, the, the world doesn't um, end the day the new CEO is in the role. Um, there's performance management that has to take place. CEOs evolve in the role. Um for good or bad. Um, and then there's, you know, usually a kind of a tremendous um, emotion laden exit process that takes place. Uh, and, and, you know, so we, we can think about, there's a lot of stuff here where um, the strategy literature is looking at it, but actually, you know, providing uh, or, or kind of looking to insights from the HR literature may actually help contribute to how strategy views this. So we'll start with the CEO succession piece. Um, and so, you know, again, the strategy approach, um, and I'll oversimplifying, right? But if you look at a lot of this strategy work on CEO succession, it kind of observes a phenomena. Okay, there was a CEO succession that took place. Either it's focused on reconstructing why that CEO was chosen. So it may be looking at, you know, past economic performance, something about the industry, um, but what is it that led to that CEO um, being chosen to be the CEO? Or it may be, okay, a CEO um, transition took place. What are the consequences? So if it was an internal person um, versus an outside person, what were the performance consequences of that? Okay, but the assumption, again, is trying to kind of reconstruct largely what the board was thinking, particularly in the in the former category of what was the board thinking when they chose this CEO? Uh, what was it that was driving that decision? Now, there's a real um, significant literature on, on uh, selection within the HR um, community. Again, a lot of it is gathering information, mostly through assessment, <clears throat> um, using data pr to predict future performance and a lot of stuff on validation studies. Um, and then this kind of whole versus partial view. And that is that when we're assessing people, are we assessing all of the characteristics that are, are going to be predictive of future performance? Or are we only um, uh, capturing some of those uh, particular characteristics? So the uh, integration piece, um, you know, there's a couple of areas where I think, you know, HR can contribute there. So first of all, I'll start with the fact that this is a board responsibility. The boards are in charge of this. So this is a group decision. Now, we don't study a lot in HR about group selection decisions, but there is a pretty significant uh, literature on, on kind of team decision-making and group decision-making. But more important is the information that boards use. Um, so again, you're going back to uh, you know the idea of, of what, what a lot of the people focusing on CEO succession is that they're trying to construct what the board was thinking. <laughs> so one example of that is uh, we, we had a meeting 
at a large financial firm where um, the CEO transition had taken place and the you know board kind of uh, or the the um, person was fired over the weekend and a lot of it was uh, believed be, to be because of something that he said um, the day before um, in a, in a, a, a PR event. Um, then when you listen to what happened actually inside, what you realize is that the CEO in waiting had already approached the board and said he was taking another job. Um, and so they fired the current CEO just to make sure they, they could keep the, the first one. So um, they had a lot more information on that person. Um, and, and then the, we also get this idea of ignoring information. So we've interviewed a number of board members about you know, their successes and failures in CEO succession. And I remember one of them saying that in one of these failures, um, they knew full well that this person was a, 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 a you know, narcissistic egotist. And they said, but we thought we could put the structures around him that would kind of control him. Okay. And so the idea is that, yeah, we knew that he was not going to, his personality was not conducive to this, but we ignored that because we thought the structure would fit around that. Um, the assessment literature, again, you know, wh what do we know about assessment? I'll go back to uh, talking with um, Marcia Avedon, who was the CHRO at uh, uh, um, Ingersoll Rand at the time. And she was saying that day that they'd had um, an external candidate in for a, an executive position. And I said, you know, by the way, so, um, you know, what, what do you do when you're hiring an outside person? And she goes, oh, she goes, and she's a PhD in IO psychology. And she goes, oh, we all know what best practice is. And that's assessment and, you know, cognitive ability and personality testing. She goes, but we can't do that because it's an external. So they don't allow us. Um, we can't really do reference checking because we can only check the references they provide. So we can't do that. And so it all boils down to an interview. And we know that an interview is the worst way to actually assess somebody, okay? And so when you look at the CEO uh, um, succession literature, what, what you often see or kind of practice is that it, it doesn't match up at all well with the ideas that what we've known for years about how to assess a candidate um, to predict their future performance. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute, but again, and then just all of this decision bias literature, you know, where, where boards are making decisions um, you know, whether it's because the CEO kind of earmarked this person as the candidate and all of a sudden there's this bandwagon effect and everybody begins to see that candidate as the future CEO, even though that candidate may or may not be the right person. So um, just to, you know, we, we actually asked about the um, assessment techniques that are used um, for, and this was with internal candidates over the previous two years. And this is uh, the, our most recent survey of chief HR officers. And this is internal CHR, CEO um, successor candidates. And what you see is that, you know, in terms of formal assessment, which is what the selection literature would say you want to do, um, it's not used all that much. Personality tests is probably the most formal assessment, and about 60% of companies have done that. Cognitive ability testing, which is arguably the most predictive um, assessment measure across all of the literature. Um, used in a, just over 50%, work sample simulations, business simulations, 40%, 30%, um, so on down the line. Now, you do at least get an example, uh, 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 the value of 360 degree evaluations that if they have them, they tend to use them. However, go back to the external candidates, where you know nothing or virtually nothing about this person. Again, really you see that less than half use formal assessment techniques to, to assess potential successors from the outside, um, which, which again runs completely counter um, to all of the literature within HR about how you would assess the characteristics of a, a potential job candidate. And then just comparing the internals versus externals, what you see is that um, externals who you have far less information on companies are using far fewer formal assessments and, and using them to a, a, a less ex, lesser extent, um, which makes absolutely no sense um, within the assessment literature. Um, and, and then the last thing is just the process. Again, boards come together infrequently with limited information and with little opportunity to actually cohere as a team. Um, and yet they're being asked to make these decisions when they have very uh, limited opportunities to see candidates, 
Um, they only get exposed to the candidates in the way the CEO or the organization allows them to be exposed. Um, and so then you, you take go into the kind of group and team dynamics literature um, that would really be valuable to helping to understand how boards actually make these succession decisions. Then when you get into performance management, I, similarly, the board has limited exposure to the CEO. I mean, it might be four times a year, six times a year for a day and a half. Um, they, they tend to look at results. And again, we've asked them about you know, how they knew whether or not they'd made the right decision once they'd uh, selected the new CEO. Um, and they talked, uh, really, they say the, the results for the first year to 18 months are actually the results of the previous CEO. So they can't look at that. So all they can do is observe the dynamics in the board meeting. Um, you know, does the team look like they're doing, you know, the, like they're excited about the CEO? Um, what are the nonverbals like? Does the CEO seem to be making the right moves and so on, um, which, which is not really great information. Um, what, what do they don't have? They don't have leadership style. They don't really know how this person leads out in the organization because they don't have an opportunity to observe it. And then they don't understand kind of the frustration, anxiety, lack of focus. I, I just had a CHRO in my class um, about a month ago who talked about how she and the general counsel had to go to the board and say, the CEO is paralyzed right now. I mean, it, you have to exit him because he cannot make a decision. And absent internal people presenting the board with that information, the board simply wouldn't have known. Talk about CEO evolution. Like there's a, a, a massive literature, right, on CEO narcissism. Um, a lot of stuff around narcissism and, you know, whether that's a good or a bad thing, you know, some research says it's good. Um, some research says it's bad. But one of the interesting things is, do they get selected as narcissists or do they become narcissists um, within that role when they're surrounded by people that are telling them how great they are and people that refuse to confront them and they've got huge pay packages um, and they've got tremendous perks? Does that drive narcissism? And again, having a conversation with a CHRO um, around this idea of, you know, when do CEOs speak out or sign on to statements and so on, uh, the kind of sociopolitical activism. And she talked about her CEO. She said, you know, um, being in the job changes them. She said, you know, early on, he never would have done this. He would have asked for advice. Um, and it was with regard to signing the um, statement opposing the Georgia voting rights law. She goes, he never would have done that. Um, but, you know, he'd been in there, he began to get kind of full of himself and, you know, a couple of friends said, hey, sign this and he signed it. Um, and then when the organization went absolutely crazy, um, their Slack channel had never seen so much, um, you know, kind of opposition, they had to shut down the Slack channel. And his response was, ah, this will blow over. Okay, so where did that come from? Somebody who started off as a humble, kind of normal person, very, com very competent, um, where do they get to where they're so kind of hubristic and narcissistic that they don't think they need to listen to anybody else anymore? And then last is kind of the CEO exit and transition. Um, you know, we, we all saw the Bob Iger story at Disney, right? And if you read up on that, what you read up on was that he never really left. I mean, his identity is clearly grounded in being CEO of Disney. And when he stepped out of the role, he began to lose that identity and began to you know, kind of work behind the scenes to get that identity back. Um, we see that all the time where um, people talk about the fact that, you know, the day the CEO leaves, it is a, a tremendous um, emotion laden, anxiety prone event because who they've been for the last 10 or 15 years is no longer true. Um, and in fact, there are consulting firms now set up about helping them manage that transition um, where they try and get them at least a year to two years in advance, thinking through what's their next step when they're no longer a CEO. What are the things they're going to do that are going to um, kind of impact their day? And then last, with regard to dynamic capabilities, um, again, you know, the, the dynamic capabilities literature is good at kind of talking about um, leaders who need to sense the change and then kind of identify what's the direction of change, implementing it, um, creating those kinds of processes and capabilities. But all of that requires change from employees. Um, and going back to some of the previous uh, presentations, you know, we've done a lot of work on HR flexibility and looking at the skills, the behaviors, and kind of the HR practices. 
And what do those mean in terms of both resource and coordination flexibility? Um, and, and so again, I think there's an HR literature that really helps, can help uh, contribute to the dynamic capabilities literature about what actually happens that creates dynamic capabilities within an organization. And so with that, let me hand it off back to Philip. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick. Uh, so we've heard five very, very uh, interesting and different uh, perspective uh, on this topic. And so I would like to um, open the floor for any comments, for any questions. And of course, that also applies to the uh, panelists. So if you've got any uh, additional points you want to make on your fellow panelists' uh, uh, presentation, please feel free. So uh, we've got uh, Branaf, if you could, uh, yes, Hi. there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thanks so much uh, uh, to all the speakers. Uh, my question is more uh, building on what Rebecca said, more like a tart, a quiche and pie kind of a question. Uh, could uh, the panelists uh, shed some light on uh, the overlaps and differences between strategic human resource management and strategic human capital? We see, uh, you know, people using these terms and, uh, uh, literature is developing, but uh, what are the overlaps and differences, according to you, uh, for somebody who's uh, trying to work in this space? But uh, there seems to be some uh, blurry lines here. Very good point. Any of the panelists would like to tackle this? And of course, Peter Capelli would be ideal yeah. because he was talking about it, right? So I, I thought I'll, I'll let Rebecca um, uh, weigh in on this since it was kind of directed to her, but having been old and around through the whole um, evolution of it, um, <clears throat> it's a great question. Um, I, I would say if you had to distinguish the two fields, I would say that the strategic HR literature tends to focus more on the HR practices, <clears throat> whereas the human capital literature focuses more on the human capital. Um, and uh, secondly, I would say the, the strategic HR literature um, has a greater role and focus on the HR function within the organization, whereas the human capital literature um, tends to ignore the function and focus more on kind of the workforce um, human capital itself. I would agree with those points. I also, I, I personally struggle a little because I I work in both areas. I started out in strategic HR, and then I uh, started doing some work in the strategic human capital space, hanging out with kind of that crowd. Um, and I think for me, some of it, um, this this might not be terribly helpful in thinking about drawing lines between the, the fields. I think some of it does relate back to, in practice, the, the perspective or the lens that we're taking and the questions that we're asking. So I if, if we kind of accept this broad interest in understanding when and how human capital contributes to competitive advantage, um, I think how we go about answering those questions is often influenced and then influenced by and then reflects kind of the, the discipline that we came from. And that that goes back to and reinforces what Pat just said about the you know, the HR people tend to focus more on the HR function and then the human capital people tend to focus more on the human capital. But um, I don't know, I, I think personally that it's a shame that there continues to be so much of that, so much of the ability to be able to say that, right? I, I think we need to be working truly at the intersection. So I actually, uh, in the original version of my presentation, I had this picture of uh, these roads that were just sort of, it was some sort of major, um, major city roundabout kind of like roads going in all different directions. And when I look closely at the picture, there weren't any true intersections. There were roads that were sort of going side by side and then went in different directions. And it was, is kind of reflective of the way that I see some of the work being done in this area. I think there is more opportunity for cross fertilization. And that makes me sound like a broken record because, uh, People have been saying this for 10 or more years, but I think it continues to be true. I think there continue to be opportunities there. Thank you so much. Um, let me see, we've, we're actually over time already, unless there's a very quick question by anybody uh, that the panelists can answer. Um, anybody has any other question or comment? 
Now, if not, uh, let me uh, close the session. First of all, I really would like to thank all the panelists uh, for their fantastic presentations and insights that uh, they've provided for their time, for their generosity as well. I think we're all walking away with uh, inspiration, greater clarity, uh, different perspectives uh, to think about the intersection of strategic uh, human capital or strategic management rather, and, and of course, HR. Uh, this has been recorded. Uh, so in case there was a particular part uh, that you'd like to revisit uh, we're going to upload the video on YouTube um, and also I would like to take the opportunity the last thing really uh, to advertise uh, the upcoming uh, AOM SDR virtual symposia okay uh, uh, the next one uh, on uh, strategic resources and capabilities of industry 4.0 uh, then the uh, virtual symposium on strategic human capital research. And then lastly, of course, also the uh, virtual symposium on corporate strategy research. All of these will feature a cutting edge research on these topics. And so the QR codes here you can use to sign up directly uh, to the Zoom link. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, participating.